This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes, And I'm your host, Michaela Ann. And since this show is not even a year old, thank you so much for checking us out if it's your first time. Thank you for coming back if you're a repeat listener. Yeah, if you are a repeat listener and you have a favorite episode, if you wouldn't mind just passing that along to somebody that has no idea who we are, we'd really appreciate that. The way we can keep having these conversations is by getting in front of new listeners. And the best way to do that is word of mouth. We don't have any sponsors. We don't have any backers. Nobody writes about podcasts. So if you could just take a second and pass an episode that you love on to somebody that doesn't yet love us, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, and we're not your typical promo show if you want to describe it to them. We are not promoting artists' albums or tours. We're talking about all the stuff that we don't post about on social media, the conversations that we would be typically having around the dinner table, the really honest behind-the-scenes stuff, and how we all keep going in an ever-changing, challenging industry, how we stay inspired, creative, and sane while building a career around art. Which is an insane thing to do. And so we have these conversations by focusing on our circle of influence and what is within our control, because there's so much in this industry that is outside of our control. So for us, that's our mindsets, our creativity, and what we actually make. We distill that down to the question, what do you do to create sustainability in your life so that you can sustain your creativity? And we ask that question of the great Gretchen Peters in today's episode. I am a huge Gretchen Peters fan. Met her, I think, once in the lobby of the Hutton Hotel during Americana Fest and then tweeted at her some fangirl thing of like, I don't know if you knew, but this is me type of thing. Anyways, (laughs) her songs cut to the core. She is Grammy nominated, CMA winning. She's in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. She has written hit songs for Martina McBride, Etta James, Trisha Yearwood, George Strait, Patti Loveless. She has a cut on the first Shania Twain record. Neil Diamond, she has co-rates and duets with Brian Adams. She has toured relentlessly, and one of the big parts of this conversation was talking about her decision to retire from touring. Yeah, and with that, I'm sure that sentence alone sparked a lot of emotions in our listeners. You know, so with that, we talk a lot about the idea of like weakness and strength and using those words towards artists and by artists. And we also spent a lot of time talking about one of my favorite things, which is recalibrating your idea of success on what you actually create and not on numbers and not on some kind of metric that is outside of our control, like ticket sales. And talk about something really important, which is why is it important to talk about the culture and industry expectations in the music world and not just see it as complaining? And if you can't hack it, move on. So I love that aspect of this conversation. Yeah, this is one of those episodes that's really fun where we just start on the edge of the diving board and jump right in right from the start. So we're not going to keep you from it. Without further ado, here is our conversation with Gretchen Peters. Thank you so much for being willing to sit with us for an hour and talk about all of the things. I feel like I kind of want to jump right in at the point of one of the bigger things we had said we want to talk about that you had said you want to talk about also it's made its resurgent recently of people taking a clip from your statement that you released when you announced that you were retiring from touring and it just started getting shared like wildfire on um, social media I think a couple weeks ago it went viral it was just an excerpt from my like public announcement that we're not going to be touring anymore and it was just really the tail end of it was just me wanting to express my dismay over what is seemingly asked of artists now over and above just making art and how i think i mean from my point of view how overwhelming it is how exhausting it is and for an artist such as myself and i know there are a lot of people out there like me who really needs time to just let things germinate this constant need for output I think it does harm. I think it's not the natural state, certainly not my natural state. I'm not productive 100% of the time or even probably 50% of the time. But I look at all that dormant time as being part of the process. It's not just that you're sitting around on the couch watching TV and eating bonbons. The fuel that 
fuels you creatively is replenishing itself. And I feel like artists just are really not getting that time because of all these demands for really silly things. Make another reel. Make sure you make X amount of posts a week. Make them engaging. Be this, be that. And mm -hmm. I just think it's killing the soul of a lot of creative people, or at least it's depleting them. And when they're depleted, they're not going to be able to give us their best. And after all, that's what we want. I want my favorite artists to have their downtime and have their creative time so that the next thing that they bring forth into the world is something that I treasure. And I think we're going in the wrong direction that way. I think what's hard for people to understand are what are the real consequences of losing great artists or great art? Because I just read this Substack email the other day from someone who isn't a musician but is in the music industry and was talking about all these announcements, people still on even higher levels of touring, canceling tours, talking about the very real economic challenges of touring and the physical and emotional hardships of touring. And in the essay, they were saying, I have such empathy for these artists, but at the same time, I hope it doesn't breed weakness. And I felt myself just be like, who? are you <laughs> that's such a um boy isn't that a like a statement about what a sort of toxic um, yeah environment we're all living in and breathing in i mean the idea that strength and weakness is the measure of anything to me the people that have gotten me through the last seven or eight years by and large are artists and that's how it's always been since time began that's what our function is. I think that our function is to look at the world, synthesize or distill what we're seeing, try to put it in a form that creates empathy between the artist and whoever the audience is, whoever's, I hate to use the word consuming, but consuming the art. And it, it helps us do two things. I think it helps us make sense of what's happening to the extent that we can make sense of it, but it's essential to human beings because it makes us know that we're not alone. It makes mm -hmm. us feel community with other humans. And God knows through what we've all been through the last six, seven, eight years, we need that so much. And this idea of we don't want weak artists, it's fascist. It also breeds the idea that I think has been ingrained in a lot of us of it'll just weed out the weak ones. And so it's not a big deal. It's the distorted idea of like the cream rises to the top. But what kind of cream is rising to the what top? What kind of cream? And it's also okay, so the parallel might be the extreme emphasis on looks in the music business. Let's just weed out the ugly ones. It makes about as much sense as that. And really, let's weed out the ones who don't have money to support right. this, because right. that's also a very real challenge of building a music career. Exactly. And I think the strength or weakness thing is just part of our kind of toxic productivity fetish. And I think for me, I was living in that matrix for a really long time. I felt that if I wasn't productive in some sense every single day, I was failing. And I lived that way for a long time, decades, probably. Mm -hmm. And getting outside of that and realizing that you have basic stuff, like you have the right to exist on Earth without producing something every day. You don't have to be a, a worker bee all the time. I just think once you get outside of that, you can't ever see it the same way. And the whole thing feels that it imposes this idea of strength and weakness and this idea of competition and this the idea of you're either winning or you're losing on a thing that isn't about winning or losing. If you really take it to its extreme, and I would, I don't think art is a competitive sport. And I don't think there is a best album or a best new artist or a best this mm -hmm. or that. It's fine if you can keep that stuff out of your psyche and keep it from affecting you if you're not the best. But I mean, I just don't think that's what we're really about. And what worries me and what was in that little clip that went viral was really just my own thoughts about my own plea to please, especially young artists, please try to protect yourself and the part of you that is vulnerable because that's the part that makes the art from this kind of toxic way of thinking because we need you and we need your best work. We need the work that you want to bring into the world, not your latest Instagram clip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always am relating to like the commoditization of the art. You have all of these industry people 
luckily some of them have been artists and I think they're a little more understanding. They have been in the trenches, but a lot of these people are coming from a place in my experience of loving music and being big fans, but not understanding the creation aspect. When you put that kind of pressure for capitalization on art, it inevitably makes it a product and it makes it a commodity. And essentially the artists get turned into livestock and we're cows that need to be milked all the time and you know we're not producing enough milk or whatever and then someone was thinking about the other day keeping the farm analogy going i mean you relate that to fields if you're planting the same crops in the same fields every year eventually it's not going to grow anything and you're going to suck all the nutrients out of the field and you have to rotate that around and it's been proven time and time again in in farming that is as you rotate the fields it'll become more productive you get more you actually produce more you get more money whatever it is and i just don't see that being accepted in the creative industry the greatest and the wisest mentors that I've had, including publishers along the way in my career, have, I mean, lucky me, they have always said, take the time you need. If you need to get in the car and drive to Florida and just think, just take the time you need. They have understood artists and how they tick and how they work. If you don't have that, it can be really crushing this kind of pressure. I mean, the commodification has always existed and it always mm -hmm. will. And we do have to just deal with that. But I think like with a lot of things that get out of balance, we're out of balance. I think the whole world is out of balance, but that's another podcast. But I mean, I think <laughs> we're, I think we are out of balance in terms of what we demand from artists. And I did get a little blowback from that. Not a lot, but I got mostly amen, 100% agree. But there was a little blowback and it came in the form of the Beatles put out X amount of albums a year back then. And so-and-so was, you know, you had to put an album out every six months and they managed to do it. So what's wrong with you? That kind of thing. Yeah. And I would just submit that the environment we're living in, the pressures, there was no social media. Also, the Beatles were young people and not all artists were the Beatles. I mean, I, I just think that's a specious argument for so many reasons, but none of us existed in a world where there was social media. You heard from the Beatles when the Beatles had something to say. And right. then mm -hmm. when they didn't, you didn't. And you waited because you were a fan of the Beatles and that's how it worked. It's not like that anymore. I don't think that's really a valid. We're not living in those times. And I think we have to get back into balance somehow. And I know it's easy for me to say because I'm an independent artist. I own my own record label. I'm not under pressure from a you know an A&R person or anyone at a label to you know, put out more social media posts or whatever. But I just think artists have to come from a place of self-protection in the midst of all of this. Two things in response to that, I feel like there is also an argument of would the Beatles even be possible today? Would they be able to create the music that they created and have that creativity and that freedom in a world of streaming and not massive record sales that have so much money and the social media demand and the taxing of their brains, you know, that social media and our phones and all of those things do to us. You know, it's a hypothetical, so you never know. But I think it's hard to imagine the Beatles. There isn't a band like the Beatles today. Well, I'd also like to point out that the Beatles also stopped touring. Yeah. Right. Very early. Very early. Yeah. And they were so. focusing basically on one thing. No, I think obviously it's all hypothetical and you can't know, but I just don't think that argument holds up. We're in a completely different environment now. And I guess we have to reinvent how we exist in that environment, how we cope with these pressures that are on artists now. And, you know, I know this can sound to people who are not in the middle of it, it can sound like, oh, poor me. Like I can see, you know, try getting a factory job. I understand that response, but I maintain that we really need art. We really need artists. We probably need art more than we've needed it in a long time right now mm -hmm. in this place that we are in the world where the news is just relentlessly bad and we're all trying to figure out how do we live in this world and how do we cope with it i think we need artists and we need to you know it's like a lot of things we need to value them the way we need to value teachers the way we need to get our freaking priorities straight because a society a, a healthy evolving society doesn't exist without artists, without teachers, mm -hmm. without people that think and have ideas and help us frame our own existence 
I think we're in a massive state of flux and I'm not going to keep my mouth shut about it. We appreciate people like you because I think also then the counters for people who are still coming up or don't have hit songs or are trying to like build it's the feeling of well what can we do we have to play the game and then getting to a point of deciding is trying to achieve a certain type of success and following what the roadmap is that I've been told is that worth the things that I feel like I will lose by doing this by relentlessly like being driven by posting and numbers and whatever or am I okay with the consequences of well maybe I won't be as successful as I hoped in this music industry but that means for my situation that I'll feel more connected to my actual artistry whatever it is and that's why we have these conversations because we were seeing friends who seemed like they were having their biggest year yet they're stressed and anxious because it's like, well, when do you get to slow down? This is great. But once you start gaining, then there's the anxiety of you have to keep going because now there's even more people who depend on you and you have to sustain this and build it even more. And that doesn't stop ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it never stops until you stop it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you've definitely had very big career highs and what that has felt like in different times in your life. I think about some of the highest highs and there's always that sort of cocktail of exhilaration and pride and all the things that you would expect mixed with pressure can you do that again when i won the cma for independence day everybody wanted oh we want another one of those and i knew when i wrote it i would never ever write another one of those you can't it just doesn't work like that so there's always like that pressure. And I realize much of it was self-imposed because as I said, I internalized a lot of that productivity ethic, the work ethic. I came into the music business at a time when, you know, before I even moved to Nashville, I recently listened to the first radio interview I ever did when I was 19 years old. And the interviewer asked me, what were my goals in the music business? And I was curious because it was like listening to somebody that I had never met, that 19-year-old, I don't even know who she was, but she, I said, I just want to make my living doing music. That's my goal. And I thought, wow. It wasn't like I want to be famous or I want to have a hit mm -hmm. song or I want to, it was, I just want to be able to make my living. And that was my benchmark of what it meant to be professional. Mm -hmm. And back then, that was not easily achieved, but it was an achievable thing. I mean, there was kind of, in the music industry back then, there was kind of a middle class. You know, you could move to Nashville like I did, and even if you didn't have hit songs, if you wrote enough good songs that got on people's albums, you could make a nice living. You wouldn't get rich. But there was this kind of middle class that existed in the music industry. And I know a lot of songwriters that existed in that sort of stratus. Mm -hmm. And it was an honorable thing to me. I felt like making your living as a musician, being a professional, that was a big deal to me. And I think now I look at it completely differently. I don't think, first of all, that middle class has evaporated you're scrounging on the bottom or you've made it. Mm -hmm. You're making tons of money and things are great and there's no middle. And I have told countless young musicians that have come to me and said, what do I do? This seems like the harder I work, I still have to have a day job, I can't. My definition of a success has completely changed, I think. And I wouldn't tell a young aspiring musician now that you should make that your goal to only do music. Get a job that allows you breathing room to write some songs. Do what you have to do to make your life work so that you can do this thing that you're called to do. Because let's face it, if you're called to create, then you have to do that. You're gonna be a miserable person if you don't do it. Find a way to make your life fit that. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think that's what you have to do. And don't judge yourself by externals like I do or don't have to have a day job to make this work. That's not a benchmark of anything anymore because the whole world has just completely changed. And I think it's, in turn, that's made me reevaluate my idea of success. At the heart of it, I always felt like success, to me, really meant artistic success. Like, if I feel like I've written a song that makes me proud and makes me feel like I did that well, 
that's about as successful as it gets. Whether mm -hmm. the song goes out into the world and makes a lot of money or resonates with a lot of people or maybe just a few, it's nice when that happens, but that's not really my definition. The work that I will stand on, you know, when I die and say, I did that, there's not a whole lot of correlation between what was commercially successful and what I feel was artistically successful. So I try to tell young writers and artists that too. That's really important. You're going to be looking back at your life at some point and you're going to want to have created those things that are the very best that you can do. And it's hard to do that when you're in the middle of it. It's hard to do that when you feel like nobody's listening. You don't have to find a huge audience. If you can tour and you can find a smaller audience, you can have a wonderful life. It may be hard in spots and, and money may never be plentiful, but if that's what you want to do, it's still possible to do that because I, I really do believe the one thing that is probably never going to change is that people want to be in the room and have that moment with a performer. Uh, you just can't replace any other way. You can't stream a song and have that same experience. And I just don't think there's any replacement for that. If you can do that, there's a place for you. It may not be Carnegie Hall, but there's a place. One thing, because I, I agree with everything you just said, and I'm a strong proponent of viewing your art that you create and tying your idea of success to that. To me, it stays within your circle of influence because you have complete control over what you create. And so trying to align your definition of being successful, like how close to that ideal creation you get, that perfect song in your mind, how well you captured the idea, the essence, the emotion that you're trying to convey, all of that. But one thing that I start to struggle with, at least in like conveying this to other people, is, you know, inevitably year after year, people, I think, humanly like to feel growth and progress mm -hmm. is there a way that you've found to be able to track that or keep that in perspective year after year that's not sales or money or something very Numbers tangible growing back in 2010 i had one of those years in my life that was just kind of you blow up your life it, you're everything big huge changes monumental changes shifts which is unsettling and puts you off balance but if you approach one of those years with fluidity and a willingness to be off balance just to see you know in other words if you don't push back but you just let what's happening happen i feel like there's a whole lot you can learn from that and one of the things that came out of that year for me was this absolute knowledge that i was not writing deeply enough. I wasn't making myself uncomfortable enough. I was leaning on my facility with words. I could toss off a pretty good line without really feeling it. But in the end, I felt like it showed. And this was mainly because of other writers who I really admire, friends of mine, who would write something and I would think, why aren't you pushing that hard? Why aren't you doing that? I really made a conscious decision at that point that I was just gonna go to the discomfort and talk about the things that I think about at three in the morning in the midst of a year like that. And it was terrifying because you feel naked and you feel like you're revealing all these things about yourself and you're like, do I really wanna say that? Do I really wanna put that out in the world? And what will people think of me? And of course, the big lesson is they're not thinking about you. They're mm -hmm. thinking about themselves. Mm -hmm. When you go there and you write a song that's deeply vulnerable and comes from that place of self-doubt, I think of it as that was the year I started writing the questions instead of the answers. And when you do that, people see themselves. It's like you're holding up a big mirror and they see themselves in it. And once I made that connection and realized that, I just know I felt like my writing deepened in a way. The next album that I put out after that was Hello Cruel World, which was just full of vulnerability and doubt. And I saw the reaction that the songs got, and I realized, of course, then it's not about me. It's about them. So that was, to me, like awards, money, all that stuff. That year was the most successful I've ever been because I went past whatever that barrier was in myself that was shielding myself and guarding myself from fully being seen and being vulnerable. And I'd take that success 
over any award or any financial success any day of the week because mm -hmm. it made me a much better writer and I learned some very profound things about life and about art in that year. Yeah, I think that's as good of a yardstick as any, really. Yeah, that's beautiful. Paired with that, your comment about believing that what will always be there is people wanting to be in a room with an artist. This last weekend I played some house shows that I just like posted a Google form on social media and like let fans apply to host because I wanted to try out new songs. And it was kind of an experiment. And what I took away from it was just how affirming it was that it's always there, that there were these people, the hosts were people who were deep fans of my music, but they invited their friends and community that didn't know who I was. So I wasn't like putting tickets out there to promote and sell on my name. They were saying, hey, friends and family, this is an artist I care about. She wants to you know, try out some songs. Please come over and let's eat some food and listen to her. And the experience of just people being open to that and then the exchange that happens of sitting in a room, sharing songs, sharing stories, being really vulnerable, and then what I received in return from them, I came away from it feeling like, okay, wow, that was so much more fulfilling. I wasn't building ticket history and markets to prove to agents or promoters or whatever. But on the economic side, I came home with more money than I usually do on promoted tours and clubs. But I really came home with a deeper understanding of, oh, no matter what, this is there. People are out there who want to experience art. And like you said, they're not sitting there judging me. They're listening to my stories and immediately thinking of how it pertains to their life and how they feel. And I think the challenge is holding on to that when we're sitting scrolling on our phones, when that's like our main mode of connection to others. Yeah, of course, because that doesn't exist on your phone. That whole dynamic just doesn't exist because it's virtual reality, it's a different experience. And I think that's what I meant by, I really do believe that a young artist can find their people. There may not be millions of them. There may not even be many thousands of them. Because think about it, it's very organic the way we share music. If you hear a song, you think of three or four people, oh my God, I have to play that song for so-and-so. And that's what a lot of these wonderful souls who labor for no money doing these house concerts and all kinds of things. You know, I used to have a really terrible attitude about house concerts. Back when they first started, I thought, well, I'm not playing in anybody's living room. I mean, mm -hmm. I graduated mm -hmm. from playing in living rooms. I'm never yeah. going to play in anybody's living because I used to do that when I was a teenager, you know, and that meant I wasn't a professional. Well, some of those house concerts are the most profound experiences because everyone is there not to drink. They are really there for the experience that you're bringing. So I totally get that. And I think it's really what do you value? Will you not be satisfied unless you sell thousands and thousands of tickets to a show or millions of records or... I don't know, does anyone sell millions of records? Whatever, millions of streams, mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or will you be deeply satisfied if you make that connection with people and are able to make a life doing yep. that? And I think the second option is the more soul-filling option. You know, there'll always be pop stars, and that's fine. But that's a whole other thing. That's not what we're talking about. We had a guest about 20 episodes ago named Ron Pope, who's a singer songwriter. And he made a really great point about calibrating your expectations for the music that you want to make. And so if you want to make really vulnerable, exposed, honest music, chances are you're not going to sell out arenas. And that's great. If you want to sell out arenas, there is a specific type of music where that is a real possibility. And that will change every five to 10 years. That will change what that popular music is. But if that's what you want to do, great. Then gear your art towards that outcome. But if your artistic fulfillment is in writing these really honest, vulnerable, deep, moving songs, then understand what you are writing, essentially. A couple of days ago, my husband and I were talking and he was in my band back in 1996 when we played Farm Aid in a you know outdoor stadium i don't know there were probably 50,000 people there i don't know it was my first experience playing in a venue like that and i came away feeling that i never ever wanted to do it again mm -hmm. because it's not my wheelhouse i like to have a dark room a thousand people is great a mm -hmm. hundred people is great 
but I want to create a hole for them to fall into. And that's a mm -hmm. whole different thing from playing in an arena like that or a stadium like that, where you're just pushing out, you're projecting this huge presence. Yeah. It's a different animal. And I think a lot of the trick of maintaining a healthy kind of state of mind as an artist is being honest with yourself what you actually want. Because we yeah. were so trained to want you know, I went into Farm Aid thinking, oh my God, it's Farm Aid and I'm going to play in front of 50,000 people and all kinds of great things are going to happen. And that was what had been pounded into my head, not what I really actually felt about it. And if I had been capable of being honest with myself, which a bit later I was, that's not the career I want. I never wanted that. I really ended up getting the career I wanted and should have had and the one that was appropriate for the kind of music that I make as you just said. Your process of realigning your tangible desire to the career that you actually wanted, was there a grieving process there as it changed? Totally. When my first record deal yielded a record that I was proud of and some people really loved the record and it had little pockets of success, but overall, certainly commercially, it was a complete failure. And that was the sort of, you know, the death of my major label dreams. Again, I came into the music business with, you know, that's what you wanted. You wanted to be signed by a major label and go down that road. And there was definitely a grieving over the loss of that dream. But at the same time, the entire experience of being on that label and doing all the things that I had to do, I was never comfortable. I felt like I was in a pair of shoes that didn't fit me. I mean, it just was excruciating. Everything that I had to do, people started telling me, you know, we would do TV things and they would be like, walk this way. And I'm like, I'm a singer songwriter. I don't, I don't walk. I just, I just play the guitar <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> don't tell me how to walk because then I'm going to think about how I walk and then I will be completely pair. You know, it was, yeah. it was just full of moments like that. And, and it's really, really hard to let go of what you think you want. So of course there's a grief that goes with it. And then I really think my biggest asset in my life, I've said this over and over again, my biggest asset is that I have a very big set of blinders and I have this ability to wallow for 24 hours. If I'm disappointed, if something that I wanted to happen doesn't happen, I will wallow in it for about 24 hours. Then the blinders go on and then I go forward because the work of writing the next song or making the next record or whatever it is, that's what's in front of me. And mm -hmm. that has saved me from despair, really. Always, always forward. I don't like looking back. Some anniversary of my first album passed recently and somebody suggested that I should go back and remaster it and maybe re-record the song. And I just thought, God, I can't do that. I don't even know who that was that wrote mm -hmm. those songs or made that record. I can't even listen to it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go forward. So I think that has really stood me in good stead when it comes to like moments where I have felt devastated by losing that dream of whatever it was I thought I was destined for. It took me 24, 48 hours really to go, okay, we're done with that. Next. What are we going to do now? Yeah. And I think that's been so life-saving for me to be able to think about what's my next thing. But the only way that works is if you put the work first. If what you really want is the gratification and the adulation or whatever, if what you want is external, then you're going to be spending a lot of time in a position of, please, can I have, you know? I always think the music business with artists, it puts us by default in this position of, can I please have this? Can I have a record deal? Can I have a publishing deal? Can I sell tickets? Can I play in your venue? Can I do, you know, you're always asking permission from somebody for something. And I think mental health comes instead of feeling like you're in that supplicant position all the time, instead thinking, what's the next song I'm gonna write? Mm -hmm. What's the next record I'm gonna make? What am I going to do creatively next? Because that is the only thing you have any control over at all. And it's something that you can do all by yourself. You don't need anybody's permission. And I think that kind of framing of it is super important to me. Through all of the inevitable disappointments, I always knew the work was what was next and what mattered. 
Yeah, I think about that often in regards to, you know, what we deem as a failure. Because you hear people say all the time, like, oh, there's no such thing as failure. There, there are only learning experiences, you know, which is a very quick hit of like, oh, yeah, amazing. And then so in thinking about that more, you know, I've kind of gleaned it down to it is how we respond to the failure. If you wallow in it, if play the victim card over and over to yourself, speaking inwardly here, that just perpetuates that failure. And it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy in my judgment of it then becomes a failure. But if you kind of look at where your disappointment comes from, you can look at exactly what is next. How do I make a better record? How do I write a better song? How do I step into this path that is more fulfilling and more true to what I want to do? Then this point of failure in retrospect can become this point of growth and a massive yeah. change. There's a maybe a slightly more base aspect of it, I guess, or a more petty aspect of it, which is when somebody rejects you or doesn't give you whatever the thing, the opening slot for artist X or whatever it is that you wanted, it doesn't hurt to have a little I'll show them mm -hmm. in you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt to go, the next song I write, you're going to be really sorry. That's a motivator, too. Maybe it's not your highest self, but I think a little bit of that doesn't hurt because it shows a belief in yourself. It shows a basic core belief in what you're doing and in your talent. I think the conversations that we have and why a lot of the conversations we want to have on this podcast, we have like people that are on their first record deals or first couple records. And we're like, let's talk in like five years because even like reflecting my own journey of I was so have such a different perspective when I was like just getting the first taste of yeses and then how things evolve when you start to realize, oh, there's nothing guaranteed in this business. One person can love you and adore your music and say yes to all these things. And then the next day decide, oh, I'm over it and yeah. treat you very differently. And I think when you first are getting the yeses, you think they really love me. And this is going to be like, I'm on the rise and I'm special. I mean, that kind of ties into the type of person that even becomes an artist, certainly a performer. Hey, look at me. We're all that like five-year-old kid who really gets a taste of that attention and the audience and just loves Feels it. Feels good, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, there's no denying that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, then you realize how it really works, which is that not only can someone love you one day and lose interest the next day, they can also love you one day and then someone else tells them you're not cool and then they don't love you anymore for even stupider reasons you know yeah. so it's not something you should ever hang your hopes and your aspirations on it's not reliable yeah and i think what i've been noticing in myself and what i hope is the positive evolution of those experiences is the shifting from making decisions on your art or how you live your life all within the context of well what do i think is going to get me what i want in my career even if that means I have to sacrifice my mental health for a time because it'll pay off and then I'll be able to like be healthy or sacrifice my time with my family or my personal life or whatever because it will pay off. The shift from that mindset to, okay, I am living a life that's centered around my art, but I'm also not gonna make every decision based on what I think I should do to get what I want career-wise and rather that I'm a whole human that has all these other aspects to my life and that my art is also dependent on taking care of all of that. It's yeah. like a huge shift in decision-making and how you spend your time that uh, I am observing in peers and myself and I'm very grateful for. This was a big thing in my decision to stop touring realizing that your art is part of your life. Mm -hmm. It's not a compartment that you manage over here on the side and then you manage these other things on the other. It took me an embarrassingly long time to realize that my touring life didn't exist in a vacuum. It affected everything, my health, my relationships, my ability to see people that I wanted to keep up with, every possible aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. It affected that, and it didn't exist all by itself. And that even down to the finances of it, I used to think, okay, this run has to be in the black. How do we make it be in the black? And my stepmother, actually, at one point, she said, I hope you're 
you know, you're flying to the UK four times this year. I hope you're upgrading your flight because you need to take care of yourself and be rested. And I thought, I have to be in the black. I mean, at some point, I just realized this is also your life and your health and everything else that that entails. And maybe if I can look at it more holistically, what is going to work? And I'm going to come home at the end of a tour and feel still like a human being instead of a complete wreck. And that's hard enough anyway. Touring is just brutal physically. The older you get, the more brutal it is. But in the end, it's much, much healthier to look at the whole thing in a holistic way rather than trying to compartmentalize. And again, you know, we live in this culture where compartmentalization is part of our ethos. I loved the series that came out about the guy went to work and they severed part of his brain so that when he went to work, he was just at work and his personal life didn't exist. I was like, that's a corporate dream. That's exactly what that is. And we are not made like that. Oh, yeah. I think about that all the time, yeah. especially we have a two and a half year old now. I observe it in Aaron's life too, how becoming a parent has impacted our ability to work. And for me, my experience as a woman becoming a mother and how I'm also treated so differently and just how it's like this idea of, oh, people would prefer that anybody who's operating in society like don't have children because we need to yeah. hide them away. And how do you do that? It's who we are, but it's an inconvenience because it impedes on productivity and money making and your ability to tour nonstop. It always feels at odds, but it's what makes us who we are and then therefore deepens our artistic work. How do you write a great song if you don't have a deep, rich personal life? And you can't tour nonstop and have a deep, rich personal life. There's just not enough hours. I think about your song that Patti Loveless recorded, You Don't Even Know Who I Am. I still remember the moment I heard that song. It stopped me in my tracks. And a person who hasn't lived deeply, they couldn't write that song. Yeah. Just the nuance yeah. of human experience and long-term relationships. And it feels so counterintuitive to me, these ideas especially in the music industry. Well, that sort of goes back to what we started talking about, which is artists need time. They need time for those ideas to germinate, to everybody who's written a song knows that the really big ones, the ones where you're like, I've got a tiger by this tail, this is a big idea. You know, you get excited and terrified that you won't be able to make it happen. Those are the best songs, but they're also the hardest to write. And those are the ones that take a lot of time, usually. And like you say, life experience, sometimes those songs, the ideas present themselves and you have to wait a year and a half or two years or five years before you are the human that can write that song because you're the person that's had the life that will allow them to write that song. So again, that's just another reason why I just think this relentless demand on artists to do all this other stuff that just really is not the point can really impede your artistic growth. I have two like bigger questions that I was hoping to get to at some point, but what the cycles of your life were years ago between touring and how much space would pass or time? Was there ever a year that you didn't tour at all? And then how that has evolved in recent years as like the economics of touring have changed and how you've seen that? My first record came out in 1996 and I was advised to tour strategically and selectively. I'm pretty sure that was bad advice. I think what I probably should have done then is tour everywhere and anywhere I could. I had the benefit of, I was somewhat known because I had won the CMA the year before. And I think because I was a solo writer, my name popped out more easily because it was all by itself. So I had this benefit of that. And I probably should have toured everywhere I could, but. Number one, I was advised not to for whatever reasons. And number two, I had a small child. I don't think it would have been in anybody's interest for me to be gone all the time. Certainly would have affected my child negatively. For my career, probably it would have been a, a help, but that's what it was. But the result later on, around 2004, I put out three albums. My marriage ended. My ex-husband was my producer and manager and completely involved in every aspect of my career. And that all ended and my child was grown. All I wanted was to get on the road because I felt like I had so much lost time to make mm -hmm. up for. And I got myself an agent who was a folk agent. I really 
always felt like that's where I really actually belonged anyway. And I proceeded to work every gig I could possibly get for very little. I mean, I just told her, put me out there. I don't care. I need to get a foothold here. I have a lot of time to make up for. And I toured the UK. I had always been going to the UK and I really stepped that up too. I was in a, a life position where I was able to do that. I didn't have a kid at home anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was in a good position. And it took me, especially in the US, in the folk world, there was a, oh, she's a Nashville songwriter. That's not really our thing. Mm. It probably took me 10 years to get past that with people. But, you know, talent buyers, understandably, they had the wrong idea. And that is because we, my team and me early on, had given them the wrong idea. And mm -hmm. I had gone down probably a career path that ultimately wasn't a good fit for me. But I toured relentlessly. I had the opportunity. I had the lifestyle that allowed me to do that. I was lucky that Barry and I were together and Barry had been playing music with me before that, that we could go out on the road together. So it didn't even mm -hmm. affect my primary relationship. It was perfect for a number of years. And really up until COVID hit, that's what we did. We toured and toured. But I will tell you before COVID hit, and I know this because in 2019, I felt like I was not even able to slow down enough to think about what I really wanted. If you had asked me in 2019, what do you want in life? I don't think I would have been able to say. Mm -hmm. And so I went on a retreat by myself for about a week because I just said, you know, I can't even think. We're moving so fast. I don't even know who I am or what I think or what I want or anything. So I went on this retreat. So obviously I was dealing with the question and I was dealing with probably burnout. And really the focus of this retreat for me was asking the question, who am I without this? Who would I be? What would this look like without all this? And then COVID happened and it was like the universe said, would you like a little preview? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I started to very slowly nurture the other parts of myself, like the part that likes to garden, mm -hmm. the part that loves to go hiking with my dog, the things that I just had put on the back burner forever and ever and ever, it seemed like. And it was a really slow process because my entire identity was really wrapped up in this career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I slowly started to realize during lockdown and during the three years between 2020 and now, oh, there's a person under there. There's somebody with a lot of different aspects and facets and interests and desires. And I'm not going to dry up and blow away if the touring artist isn't part of that anymore. Mm -hmm. But again, speaking about grief, there was also a lot of grief over that. Mm -hmm. I have loved that part of my life. I miss it, no question. Mm -hmm. But I just, the negatives outweigh the positives at this point. The physical toll that it takes, the way the world has changed as far as touring. I mean, you mentioned the economic realities of it. I mean, between 2019 and 2023, everything's changed. It's so much more expensive. Your bottom line, it's completely changed. Anybody that's even booked a hotel room, I don't care if you're a touring musician or not, if you've booked a hotel room or rented a car since the pandemic, you know what I'm talking about. So Yeah, it's outrageous. So that made it a little easier to go, you know, I think we're done. But also, I just... On a more global wow. level, I felt Barry and I have had this incredible adventure the last 18 years or whatever. We've had all the highs and lows, and it's been amazing, and that's enough mm -hmm. to have that. And it's time to have our private life and have... I'm getting very emotional just talking about this because it's a huge life decision. But part of that equation was... It's also time to make a little space for younger artists to come in and get those gigs. And it's yeah. just part of the natural cycle of things. I've never heard someone say that, of it's time to make space for the younger artists to come in. I really feel yeah. that. I mean, I think part of it is my experience teaching. I'm so invested in mentoring young writers and artists. It's been the most unexpected, wonderful surprise of my life, how much I love it. And I think that if I hadn't gotten into teaching, I might not feel that way. But I really feel mm -hmm. like, you know, gosh, 
God be with you. And if I can help you in any way, I would love to be of service. I love that. You said 2004 when you got an agent and really started touring. Can I ask if you're comfortable sharing how old you were when you uh, started doing that? I would have been, I was in my 40s. It's really hard to know how old I am. That's another yeah, thing yeah. that happens when you have enough birthdays. I was mid 40s, I guess. And I ask only because age is still something, of course, with women a lot. Oh, yeah. It's a constant conversation. Mm -hmm. But even with male artists, I've heard this recently of just feeling like, is it too late? You know, am I too old? And I have those questions and those fears. And I'm always like, consume stories of no, look at so and so yeah. look at so and so. And you know, my agent then that I hooked up with in 2004 also booked Eliza Gilkison, who's older than I am and was at that point in her 50s and having this flourishing, wonderful career. And that was hugely inspiring to me and made me feel, and I also felt like in the folk world, it was less of an issue. There are certainly genres and environments in which that would be much more of an issue, but I just felt I came as close to my ideal world where I was really judged on what I put out there as opposed to anything like ageism or anything like that. But really though, the age issue to me came into play more in my decision not to tour because it is physically just brutal and it's yeah. not something you can do forever. I mean, you can do it forever if you're Mick Jagger and you're on a private jet. And you don't right, lift right. anything. You don't even lift your own suitcase. But the realities <laughs> for the rest of us is we got to carry things and we've got a constant motion and that's not doable forever. You have limitations, physical limitations, it's just reality. I think it was in the pandemic or it might have been right before Roseanne Cash wrote this incredible essay in some magazine or something where she talked about just like the ups and downs of touring and addressing it and there's this scene that she describes of like flying somewhere and being with her husband and maybe a couple other musicians or something and kind of trailing behind them carrying suitcases to go get the rental car and she said I don't want to do this anymore yeah and they all stopped and turned around and said what and then it just kept walking and it was like the way she wrote about it just has stuck with me because it was what can happen where you're just like I'm done and then you go play a show and you're like oh yeah no I love this but like all of the wear and tear and those moments of like why are we going through this and I'm only in my 30s and I still relate to so many I, I remember <laughs> when that piece came out and I so related to it and it was interesting when I made my announcement once I had gone through the whole process of, okay, are we really going to do this? I decided, well, we have to be public about it because there are probably people out there that would like to see us one more time, you know? But I remember my friends who are artists and people that I knew who are artists, the reaction was very interesting. There were a number of them that went, oh God, I wish I could do that. You know, mm -hmm. I wish I could just, even just saying, I don't want to do this anymore is kind of a radical act. Oh, if yeah. it's been your whole life. But the other response I got was even maybe more interesting, which was, you can't stop, you mm -hmm. know? And I think that reaction is more about them. Mm -hmm. It really didn't have anything to do with what I was doing. It was more, if you say you're going to stop, then stopping is a possibility. And I don't want to consider that stopping is a possibility. I think that was more what that was about. But it certainly brought up feelings in people. Because stopping, I think, also has all those connotations of weakness or giving right. up or you can't handle it. Right. And the other side is all of the beautiful things that you're gaining by stopping. But it's not viewed that way. But all of the time you get to know people in your life better. Right. To go hiking on the trails. and You know, all those things that I think we consider like for normies and you're supposed to be on the road and do this forever. Right. If you don't, then who are well, you? One of the things that I really wanted out of stopping was I had gotten to a place where I had such a contentious relationship with writing because I felt like I was on this hamster wheel, write the album, make the album, go out and tour the album, rinse, repeat. And the writing is the hardest part for me by far. And Gearing up to do that again, I found myself just resisting and saying, why do I need to write another album? What is this insatiable? And it was coming from internally, but 
I mean, nobody was standing here with a whip saying, you need to make another album. You know, it was in trouble. But (laughs) nonetheless, the pressure was immense. And it was giving me, I felt like a very dysfunctional relationship with writing. And one of the things that I really wanted to discover was what would it be like to write a song with no agenda, knowing I'm not making an album necessarily. I'm just writing a song. I stopped writing during the pandemic. I didn't want to go near it. I didn't want to have anything to do Mm. with it. And the only thing that keeps that flame alive is when I get my heart cracked open by going out and hearing somebody or hearing a song that really moves me. And I wasn't getting any of that. I wasn't getting fed that way. You know, just the other night I went out and heard my friend Jeff Black and I listened to his set and I was moved to tears several times and I thought, oh, the old beast is after me again. I'm going to have to sit down and write. But at least I feel like I'm free to do whatever. I'm free to write one song and let it live in my notebook for a while without worrying about where's it going to go? Who's going to release it? What album is it going to be on? All of those things that aren't really the point. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Well, we have gone past an hour, so we want to be really respectful of your time. But thank you so much. These are the kind of conversations that we need to be having. So we really appreciate your generosity of time. And Well, it's wonderful to be able to talk about this particularly. Thank you. Yeah. Gretchen, thank you so Thanks much you guys. For, for carving out time to be here with us. I just love that you're doing this. I'm really happy to be. I know Joe Henry is a new friend of mine, and I've got your podcast with him queued up for my next walk and i saw some of the clips i'm like the guy's brilliant so he really i'm just honored to be here thank you that's a special conversation and one of those that he doesn't do anything but deep and special i mean it's his default yeah Mm -hmm. what's fascinating to me though is also in these conversations he has so much wisdom but everyone's approach and thoughts around songwriting and creativity it's not one size fits all like yeah. you and him and everybody has a different feeling about their songs there's overlap but it's just been incredible to get to see the ways like oh there's so much wisdom to take from this and yet it's different than this person's perspective who has built an incredible body of work and yeah. incredible career which is just like expanding that's what I nerd out on and get so excited about. It's the stuff that keeps us going, you know, hearing other people talk about their own process and hearing like, oh, I do that. That's a thing. Or I don't Mm -hmm. do that. Maybe I should try that. Exactly. It's great. Yeah. There's this funny anecdote of one of Michaela's songwriting students went to Rodney Crowell's camp Uh and (laughs) Joe was teaching there. That's Um, where I met him. Oh, okay. okay. I was teaching there too. Yeah. We went to lunch together every day. Like we were like new best friends. And it was oh, so cool. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. Yeah. So maybe you were present for this. I guess Joe said something about like you need to. His philosophy was that he's not a confessional right. songwriter. He's, you know, makes narratives. And he was like, you need to, you know, read 10 poems a day. And my student said that Rodney was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> his approach was so different. It was like, no, you just, you, you know, you take from your own experience and you don't need to read poetry. And, <laughs> and it's funny, but I can totally see that. And I actually think I'm more on the Joe side of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. I really believe like fiction in the form of books, poems, movies is mm-hmm. my food. And I can totally see that with Joe. But then yeah. again, I can see how Rodney's written an incredible body of work basically on that little boy that grew up in Houston. Yeah. So it's kind of wonderful that it can happen in so many different ways. But I'm with Joe. Read. Everybody read poetry. (laughs) Poetry is amazing and nobody reads it. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours podcast. You can find more info on this episode, including links to things that we talked about by going to theother22hours.com and clicking on episodes. Reviews go a long way in getting our show in front of more listeners. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to go leave a quick review wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.